anyone can become a chef. Literally, anyone can walk oh, into it. Oh, can they? Because it's a dream of mine. Oh, God, it's dream. anyone can walk into it. What does a chef eat when they're on downtime? He's on toast. toast. Awful pizzas. But that's it. You know, it's just, you get home and, you know, you're doing your 17 hour day and you're like, I'll be bothered now. It's just like stuff something and go to bed. And if I'm honest, like, it's the uncoolest answer in the world for a chef, but Jamie Oliver got me into cooking. Uh, you know, it was the right time and place. You know, I was, I'd, I'd met a long term partner. We'd stopped going out drinking all the time as you do and started staying home and cooking and. So good. Yeah, completely. You did a yeah. basketball hoop at the bottom of your spiral staircase you and a go. little Vespa. Yeah, 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 that was me. Welcome back to the Graveyard Shift. I'm Nathan Rouse. And I'm James Pugh. Oh, we're excited today because we are joined by one of the region's most innovative chefs, a man who doesn't tell you what you're eating until the very end of your meal. Um, so to get him back, we're not letting him know what questions we're asking. <laughs> so it's a very warm welcome to the owner of Restaurant Wild Chop Shirt, James Sherwin. Hello, hello, James. Morning, morning, morning. Good morning. Um, look, I know foraging is a big part of your menu. So when you wake up and it's minus three degrees, um, what are you looking for? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. At Nothing all. at all. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen. No. Okay. So I mean, oh, we've gotten to foraging early doors, haven't we? Yeah. So foraging is sort of thirty percent of what we do. Okay. It's, um, but I think it's the it's the sexy bit, isn't it? I use the word sexy loosely. Yeah, I love that. Obviously. You can say sexy. Um, so the, through the summer, we spend a lot of time picking stuff pickling, fermenting, all that kind of stuff. So now that we've got about four turnips left, we're going to start getting into that stuff. So we're not okay. encouraging anything at the moment, really, because right. it's, um, it's cold and it's grubby. Really <laughs> There's just nothing left. <laughs> I thought it'd be sort of berries. I thought on your hunt to Ironbridge, you'd be stopping off and going, oh, I can see some wild marjoram. You'd think so, up. but really I was just following <laughs> my sat nav, working out where I was going. <laughs> TL, whatever. Yeah, no, I know. Um, so look, in ter- just in terms of pickling and that sort of stuff then because mm-hmm. i mean we went to a brilliant michelin star we've been talking restaurants by the way before we before we started um the actual record button um because you and i are both i mean god you're actually doing it i'm just eating it you know it's much easier actually my, eating is the best my, bit isn't it let's be honest eating it is the best it position really but there was a fantastic restaurant i went to a michelin star place in helsinki and they all their stuff is about pickling and they're doing sort of grom Yes. Yeah, yeah. It is unbelievable. Yeah, I'm ripping uh, those guys off a little bit, if I'm oh, honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, their Instagram's brilliant, by the way, yeah. as well. I mean, their Instagram stuff. But actually, I was w- with um, with a colleague, and we were doing some work in Helsinki. We walked past this restaurant. looked pretty cute. There was a table for two. I just went and said, look, and he had no idea about it at all. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, come on, sit down. Had this incredible food. I went... I'm just going to Google this place and it is just jaw dropping. But all their stuff is fermented this, pickle yeah. that, pickle that. So I guess that's the. Yeah, well, I sort of, so I had a bit of a midlife crisis, became a chef. So I missed all that sort of Gordon Ramsay stuff and the Marco Pierre White and that French stuff. And I got into it as New Nordic was kicking off. Right, okay. You know, I missed all the Spanish El Bully stuff as well and all that kind of yeah. uh, crazy stuff. And yeah, so New, New, New Nordic was kicking off. And my first day, my head chef sent me home with a load of books, one of which was Noma. And they're talking about sorrel and sea books on and pickling yeah, yeah, this yeah, from yeah, It's like that, yeah. that's all stuff that we've got. So let's use that. Okay. And you know, that very quickly struck a chord with me and, um, yeah. And that's, and that's happening in market trading. So that's, you know, people sort of think about foraging being, you know, you need to be in the middle of nowhere. You need to be sort of, yeah, you know, Devon rolling country. Yeah. 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 Everyone has this romantic idea of like, you know, little baskets and whatnot. And really totally. it's, it's two minutes outside of my garden. You know, it's um, oh, really, there's it no really sort of is. little morels. You're skipping through the woods on a minus <laughs> three degree. Morning. Oh, you know, there's definitely some skipping. Let's not be honest. You know, let's be honest. Yeah. You know, there's love, a lot of skipping, skip. but you know, there you go. <laughs> Um, I'm going to test my French out now. Um, the word terroir. Terroir. Yeah. Terroir. It's regularly used to describe your business and your passion Nonsense. for food. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, um, what a ponce. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. No, so I wanted to, I used that, essentially used that word because I kind of wanted to give an idea what we were about. Now, terroir is a French word and they, the French winemakers use it to describe how their, their wine tastes, so their grapes taste of the, you know, uh, time and place, essentially, which is what the, okay. what the Nordics place say. So, you, you know, the wine will taste of the soil and what the weather is like and how much sunlight they have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so I, so I think there's something in this. I know our sound. But if grapes will taste one way because the soil is one way and the, they have so much rainfall, then every other plant must taste the same. And I always think it's like, and you have to sort of go with me on this. It's like regional We're not accent. rolling our eyes, by the way. Everyone's sort of glazed over. Like, what the hell's he talking about? It's like regional accents. We all speak English, 
But if we travel an hour and a half up the road, the guys who live in Liverpool sound very different to how we sound, but our base language is exactly the same. Yeah. And I think terroir is like that in that, well, you know, we t if you ask about the best rhubarb in the country, it's Yorkshire. Well, why is it Yorkshire? It's in the well, gold because, triangle. Yeah. yeah, completely. Yeah. Or, you know, you talk about... Um, uh, what's that? It's asparagus, and it's down sort of Hampshire way. Yeah, yeah, Eastern, yeah. yeah it's nice. And it's and it's because they've got that sort of little microclimate that works for them, and that's how I see terroir. And okay. and so that's kind of. But what terroir we do. and market Drayton are, are, are sort of two, maybe this is me. Maybe this is me. You know, I get that. You know, we've got very sort of set thoughts about parts of you know Shropshire. You know, in Shropshire, we've we've got a bountiful countryside and landscape, yeah, and we're lucky. We're lucky with that. But you would always have thought that sort of Ludlow of old, mid nineties, was the food capital of the county. Yep. And obviously, you know, Sean Hill disappeared. Um, and obviously, Walnut Tree is amazing. Yeah. Um, then you had Corbosi. Obviously, went down to Hibiscus and opened that up in London and ditched that. And then obviously, you had what else was there in um, by the Weir. Din and Weir. By Din and Weir. Yes, and I don't know who it was. I can't remember who it was. But that was a bit of a sort of, hey, here's eight courses. <clears throat> you don't get yeah. to choose. But at least you kind of knew what you were, at least you knew what you're eating. You don't know what you're eating at yours. Well, no, and this is the, I mean, this, I think there's two angles to the restaurant. The one is the, the sort of that whole new Nordic, Japanese, time and place type of thing. And then the other side of it is that, uh, it's the way we've designed the restaurant. We've designed it in a very specific way, but we don't give you a menu. And, there's reasons behind, you know, there's little forks to why we do that. But a lot of it is behind, you know, we're all creatures of habit. We're all, yeah. you know. Pick if, the same stuff. Yeah, we pick yeah. the same stuff. We'll pick the same wines. We'll pick the same beers. I'm never going to make, my job is to excite you, is to, you know, is to make you great food. Now, I'm if glad I, you added that last bit. Yeah, <laughs> my job is to excite you. <laughs> End the podcast here, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I keep saying to my smelly that that's her job and um, yes. she keeps looking at me. Excite it's not. Excite um, and crikey, where was I? I've gone off on the tangent, haven't I? Um, yeah, but to excite you a lot, we need to give you something different. Yeah. You know, you think about when you go abroad and what was exciting, what was memorable. It's when you don't, you know, you go somewhere like Thailand yeah. or Japan, you sort of point at stuff because you don't know what yeah. you're eating. That's the exciting thing. Yeah. Not, you know, picking the same fish and chips that you've no, had 600 no. times with the same, you know, pint of Carlin. And we've designed the whole restaurant so... You know, you go through the wine list. There's not a lot of grapes that most wine, you know, most people know. I mean, there's the, okay. you know, there's a f some that the grape nerds will know, but yeah. none of us are that guy, are we? No. Um, so we've designed it so you have to be out of your comfort zone because that's when something exciting will happen. But, but if people know that, do you, do you, does it make them feel a bit more relaxed when they're going there? Because people kind of now know that's what you are. So in some respects, there's a little bit of a uh, throw the shackles off. Hey, I'm just going to eat whatever James is putting in front of me. Yeah, I think, well, there's, I mean, I still, I have a conversation with every guest when they, when they come in and just say, look, there's no menu. And still... 50, 60% still have no idea. And I see their face kind of say, oh my God, why have we booked here? We booked it. We waited ages why to get in. What the hell's going on? Oh, I should have gone up the road. Um, but, uh, you know, some people know. But then those who are willing up front to say, right, just do what you want, they're already in that mindset mm. of let's have something different, something exciting. So yeah, I think... It's difficult, isn't it? Because, of course, you're, you're, you're trying to steer them. And we are creatures of it. I remember taking my wife to a lovely Michelin starred curry place. And um, she's like, well, you know, I, I can't, I'm not really massive in spice. I, I love a chicken tikka. I'm like, well, you're not having one here. <laughs> um, and, you know, forget the fact that you might want it with chips. Um, and I made her have, so, it sounds really miserable of me, but I kind of made her have something really totally different. And yep. she didn't really like it. And she's like, I knew it. I was like, I know, but at least you kind of now know that there isn't this amazing thing. My kids love weirdly when i make pancakes at the weekend they'll have them with a sort of chocolate spread yep. and pear halves from a tin nice now i know it's with some greek on top rolled da, da, da. jack again i've got to get jack into a podcast jack's just staring at me like i'm a weirdo um, <laughs> but i was like you know traditionally they would have been like oh we just want a tradition like a wrapped chocolate crepe or whatever it's yep. all a bit of nutella or whatever i was like no, no no let's elevate this a little bit and they were like no, no. and now honestly they are advocates of of a sort of slightly sexed up pancake yeah. now if i hadn't have done that they'd have still had the same thing so yeah. you're kind of doing what every parent i guess is you trying to, to do you, you, you know and i'm the same as well you know you have to force people to try things sometimes mm. um and you know they choose whether they want to be forced into it or not but well the first time we took some friends to yours when you're in in um when you're on the a53 roundabout yeah. yeah um 
we took some friends and I remember you sort of sitting down and they were a bit freaked out. There was sort of no menu. And um, you sat and... You still get that. Yeah, I think you asked at the beginning, is there anything you really, really don't like? And I think Annabelle had said, um, well, I'm not really like awfully sort of sweet ready sort of stuff. And you're like, yeah, yeah, no worries. And then at the end, you came back round and said, what did you like? She was like, the first course was the best. And you went, sweetbreads. And she's like, what? But I said, I didn't like sweetbreads. And you said, well, you said that was your favourite course. And it's really interesting because it, it does change perceptions. You'd never have ordered it, ordered yeah. it otherwise. Well, we had, you know, with that course, I know the course you're thinking of, because it's the only time we've done them, actually. And we had another te- lady who, at that same time, was a... She was a table of four, and generally with a table of four, there's one person who's been dragged along against their will, you know. <laughs> their friends want to go, their other half wants to go. <laughs> and she, she, they were the last table I was going to speak to that night and sort of explaining what we were going to do, et cetera, et cetera. And she spent the whole time sat next to the wall sort of scowling at me, you know, I could feel these eyes burning into me. And I was like, all right, she's the one, that's fine. And I sort of said, look, you know, are there any allergies or anything like that that you're going to tell me about this... Um, I'm going to sort of spoil my night a little bit. I said, I don't eat sweetbreads, quite aggressively. And I was like, all right, fair enough, cool. Uh, went back to the kitchen, sent them out because they were the first course still. And Double yeah. sweetbreads for table 18. Yeah. 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 You know, she loved them. And, and then she was slightly annoyed at the end that she'd enjoyed them. So some people <laughs> will react really sort of, yeah. in, you know, they're really interested about the process and what we're doing and like interested that they've enjoyed something that they tried 30 years ago and hated. Whereas this woman acted quite, she was quite militant about it and uh, was very, very annoyed that I'd, you know, yeah. give her something she didn't like, but she enjoyed it. And yeah. So and she would I never have ordered it. No, not would at you, all. Are you a sweetbread orderer? I've James? never had sweetbread, but I'm not, you know, I would quite happily try it. If it was put Ooh, in front testicles. I mean, it's quite nice, sautéed, you know. <laughs> Our bread course at the moment, so I, I always serve bread because I love bread. You know, just a little bread. different. So we serve it with a, a little serving of butter made with miso. And then um, a, a little dip made from ke- a reduction of kelp, which is a type of seaweed. And it just reads on the menu, kelp and miso. Not a single person would order that. No. Every single person every night, like, that was the course. The bowl it comes in is amazing. It's just and like it's just, a yeah. beautiful... And it's that whole thing. And Well, we've got some to try to this morning. Yeah, definitely. Uh, haven't we, James? <laughs> James yeah. has come laden with... Goodies. Um, <laughs> Told you it was toss, icy. Toss is pretty icy out there. Um, but look, uh, chef isn't, you know, you were saying you were late to chefing, I guess, yeah. you know, the sort of, yeah. um, and pre that, um, a paediatric nurse. Yes. Which is not really an automatic, unless no. you just like uniforms. I mean, maybe it's a, That's maybe it it's a uniform <laughs> thing. I like the whites. <laughs> like the <forming>. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, I fell into that. One of my, I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to work in a record shop when I was 18. Um, I was doing my A-levels and one of my teachers said, you'd be a good nurse. I don't know what her justification for it was. Um, she, I think she used to be a psychiatric nurse or something. Now she was teaching biology A-level. I was like, all right, that'll do. Um, so I applied for it and the, the application form came and it was like mental health, adults, Pediatrics, though, and pediatrics might be fun. You play football and stuff with them. Right, There's okay. nothing like that. Um, <laughs> with the breaking like, kids, uh, you can't actually yeah. play football, I'm afraid. I tried to give a kid with no hands a high five once. That was one of my <laughs> lowest moments. It was Ooh, so bad. bad. But anyway, that, 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 <laughs> we'll move past that. Um, but yeah, I didn't really enjoy it. I hated that for like 13 odd years I did it. Um, it just wasn't my thing. For how long? About 13 years. <laughs> long old time. Hang on, no, I no, hate no, it no, for no, 30. Yeah. Most people say 30 weeks. You know, long time maybe, to be miserable. Isn't maybe 13. Like, yeah. Miserable paediatric. Well, you know what it's like. They, I mean, know. all the kids are going, oh, can we not have James, oh, God, please? not that guy. <laughs> not here. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know what it is? You know, sort of life gets in the way, doesn't it? You know, you sort of, you're in a relationship and then you're not. And then you meet a girl and you, who also works with you. And then you get married and you have kids. And, and so you just sort of stick with things, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, I hate this. So you um you become a chef instead. And anyone can become a chef. Literally anyone can walk oh, into it. Oh, can they? Because it's a dream of mine. Oh, I God, it's dream. anyone can walk into it. Let me do work experience with you. Can we have this live that you say, yes, Nathan? <laughs> yes, yes, you can. In my tiny kitchen, which is smaller than this table. <laughs> Be great. We'll get on like a house on fire. Really, I can't open my oven because I'm too fat to open the oven at the same in front of it. I have to um, stand to the Never side. Never trust and... a thin chef. There you go. You know, I think there that's what Yeah, no, I've always, yeah. I've always wanted to be a chef. I always watch all the TV yeah. shows and I'm like, oh, I wish I could do that. Now. You come in with white sliced sandwiches, James. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I eat as this well. This is the problem, yeah. See, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. What, what does a chef eat when they're on downtime? Are you just grazing? White like, sliced in... sandwiches, yeah. White sliced. Yeah. That's a sort of good Cheese chef. on toast. Cheese, Cheese on, on toast. toast. Awful pizzas. 
but that's it. You know, it's just, you get home and, you know, you're doing your 17 hour day and you're like, I can't be bothered now. It's just like stuff something in and go to bed. And Marcus Waring saying that. So yeah, you're getting in at midnight and just eating crap and then yeah, getting up pretty in the morning much. and then, you And know. then off again. Yeah. So if I wanted to be a chef, right? Yeah. 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 Sorry, Nathan. Um, no. Tomorrow I'm going to become a chef. <clears throat> yeah. Um, we'll try and work this out. <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> first port of call. So for me... We've well, got to I... hand out your notice first, obviously, <laughs> yeah. James. Uh, so I got... Um, I was with a long-term partner. I say a long, long-term partner. She's my long-term partner now. We hadn't long got together at that point, but, you know, oh, right. she is anyway. Um, you know, I hadn't got kids and stuff like that. I couldn't, you know, get up and move to Copenhagen, which is the centre of the world. I'm like, right, I'm going to go work in Copenhagen. Uh, so I contacted a few restaurants in Shrewsbury where I was living, and I sort of looked up who was the best chef in Shrewsbury. I found it was said, can I come work for you for free? Who was that? Uh, a guy called Chris Cond, who was at Henry Tudor House at the yeah. time. Um, he'd come from a place called Grins Hill. He'd had three AA rosettes. Yeah. He was in the Michelin Guide. Um, he'd done pretty well on MasterChef Professional. So I was like, right, I'm going to go with him. So he phoned him up, said, right, can I come work for free? And he, I think he sort of laughed at me down the fence. Yeah, all right then. <laughs> um, so I went in, I started doing that, but I'd, I'd also come off the back of a TV show as well. So I'd, I'd filled in an app, uh, like a, not an application form. The chase. The taste. <laughs> the taste. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That confused me for a second. So yeah. quite similar. Did I do the chase? Or was it the chase? I think Did I win any money? Yeah. Was the beast there? Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so... Okay. Do you, um, do you watch the chase yet? There you go. So I'd, I'd, I'd been on Twitter one day, filled in this sort of... Um, had this form, just asking my opinions on food. Anyway, I got a phone call from a producer saying, do you want to come and do a TV show? I was like, all right, cool. Why not? So I did. Um, now, Jella Lawson was a judge. Anthony Bourdain was a judge. Wow, Call the this great late there. Anthony Bourdain. Um, and anyway, so uh, that was that was home cooks and professional chefs. And a load of the professional chefs are talking about pop-ups and stuff. So I came back from that. All right, I'm going to do pop-ups. But I'm going to go work in a restaurant for free as well to actually learn some skills because okay. I haven't yeah. got a clue what I'm doing. And I really hadn't got a clue what I was so doing. So no trade. So not sources, not your bases. You hadn't done any Nothing of that training. No, no, okay. what, Knife what skills. I, no, what I knew is stuff I... You know, learn from reading Jamie Oliver books, essentially. Fine. At, but at this point, you were making stuff at home and trying things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'd, um, I'd, I watched the, um, uh, I don't know if you remember it, Jamie's Italy series. Yeah, first yeah. Time. It was the best books, actually, as there well. There you go. Well, brilliant book. Yeah, mm. I got bought that book, or I bought that book, I don't know. And I made the risotto in there. First, the there's a roasted mushroom okay. risotto. Okay. And I was like, I just made Bianca's that. Bianca's great. Well. Yeah. Just brilliant. I was like, yeah. it's absolutely incredible. I started cooking from there and really enjoyed it. And one thing led to another. Uh, but anyway, so started working in the restaurant for free. They eventually gave me a job, which is exactly what would happen because anyone could get a job in a restaurant because there's no staff anywhere, regardless of skill set. And um, yeah, one thing led to another and then onto another restaurant and then to my first head chef position. Right, where was that? Uh, a place called Drayton Gate in Wem. Now that lasted about four minutes, I think. Um, <laughs> now they I opened the Drayton restaurant Gate. Your job. <laughs> Drayton Gate yeah. shut the gate behind there you, you very go. quickly. I was very open about what I wanted to do, and then yeah. I got there, and they didn't want it. So, okay, we parted away, and then that was sort of the, my last job. After that, it was like, right, I'm going to do pop ups, and we'll open a place eventually. Yeah, and then yeah, met you at Turnhill, and that was so kind of it. Good. And where were you popping up? Where all over the place? Where you could? Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I mean. I was in Shrewsbury. Uh, we were living in Shrewsbury when I first started, so mostly in Shrewsbury and sort of cafe. Like uh, literally, I came back from filming at Pinewood from the show, and I walked around all the cafes in Shrewsbury and said, "Can I do a pop up here?" And everybody but one sort of like, "What are you talking about? Who are you?" Yeah. Because yeah. I didn't want to mention the TV show because I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on TV. And what year is this, by the way? Because there's, you know, because I don't know. Shrewsbury had sort. Of Nothing for a long time. I had this restaurant called Sol in the late nineties, yeah, yeah, which yeah. was kind of you know top yeah, of world. Everyone's like, "Well, wow, isn't this great?" It wasn't actually that much else. I think. I hope that nobody from Shrewsbury's going to listen to this, but I think that's still the fingers case. crossed. No. Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, you got the Walrus, Walrus is got Dolce Vita. Dolce Vita. Actually, it was at Dolce Vita on last Friday. That guy's ridiculous. Do you know good. It's unbelievable. I met him once at a little the charity thing we were doing, and. I was being a bit of a snob, I just because La Dolce Vita sells itself as a little Italian trattoria. Exactly, same. And, you know, there's all these really good chefs, and me, and Gennaro. And I was like, oh, this guy, you know, who's this guy? And he said, oh, yeah, I worked at Long Clean for two years, and his dish was head and shoulders above yeah. anything else that came out that night. Yeah. Because um, I saw Stu Phillips from 100 House, who I really like and oh, yeah, rate, yeah, yeah. a couple of days later. And I was like, oh, we've just had a brilliant tasting menu yeah. at Dolce Vita. He's like, oh, that's Gennaro. He used to work here. He said he could work anywhere. Yeah. Like literally anywhere. That, that guy is amazing. And it was just, it's really sweet. 
maybe sort of 10, 12 tables, you know, humble. Yeah. But the food was, no, yeah, it's phenomenal. carbon good. oil on the, you know, yeah. sort of macro ceviche was just crazy. Because yep. like, oh my God, smoked. Have you smoked it? No. I was like, have, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, everybody else is just eating. I'm like, what is going on here? What's that? Yeah, I know. Um, so I no, yeah, yeah, he's super good. He's, um, but I think they're kind of, I mean, the market hall's great as well, but that's a very different little thing. There's yeah. lots of little leeches in there. Again, you probably have a little bit of a romance then about the pop-up because market hall seems quite pop up y Yeah, I guess. Completely, completely. And it was fun, you know, we kind of try everything. It was almost like um, there was no accountability, really. You know, we could do it, and if it was rubbish, then... It yeah. wasn't bricks and mortar. I'm going to pay the bill, you know. No, agreed. So it was. It was really. It was not. And kind of. It was nice to sort of learn that way and almost grew up in public slightly because every little thing we're learning is then uh, our next pop up, etc., etc., yeah. and it carries on. And I mean, even to this day, we're still because everything's so open, and you know, we're still learning to an, you know a, a great deal. You know, it's, yeah. It's. And you're still eating. You said earlier, right, I've been off to here, I've been off yeah, to yeah. had a, you know, a dinner there. You yeah. know, I guess you're already soaking well, up stuff as well. I mean, I everything had, you do. I had somebody come, I don't know, maybe a month ago, and they'd come to Turn Hill. And that was four years ago now. Maybe, is it? Maybe longer than that. And they were like, this is incredible compared to that. Which is supposed to be, because, you know, you've got that much more training and that much more experience under your wow. belt and whatnot. Okay. But it's, um, yeah. Oh, we'll do a team tasting. We'll do a team yeah, tasting menu. Yeah, that, yeah. That'd there we be, go. That'd be great. If you can get us in, that'd be great. I'd stop the fridge, though, eh? With our, with our browns <laughs> discount. <laughs> Maybe. Right, next one's on Next one's on you. Um, your business, is it fair to say it's sort of led by the seasons? And if that's sort of the case, are there sort of limitations to what you can you know, cook? Um... Yes, and yes, and so, I mean, I don't, it's going to sound really pretentious there, but I kind of don't believe in seasonality. Yeah. Um, things come and go when they're ready. So last year, we still had lettuces in the ground, and there was snow on them. Okay. And you think, lettuce is July, or mm. you don't think in December. Wow. And uh, so, yes, it's, I mean, I suppose there is, there are seasonal trends in terms of, you know, we're not getting much asparagus in January, but... That kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, depending on if it's raining, we can't use any of the, the flowers we use for stuff because all the pollen's gone away. And so there's no, you know, there's no flavor in them. Um, things like that. So, you know, we'll have, we had a dish a while ago. It was um, chicken with kale flowers. So we'd left the kale in over the winter. And for two weeks, we had these little kale flowers and they taste like a really sweet version of kale. And they're delicious and they look really pretty. And so we had that for two weeks and then it was gone again. Um, so we'd sort of, much more micro seasonal than right. Okay, you know when you get your posts the same like this month, this is going to be good. Yeah. We kind of don't get that. It's good when it's good, and it's gone when it's gone. And but kind of Kenyan strawberries in January. Try not to. Kind of, try not <laughs> to. Not to but it's amazing, isn't it? We've, we've, we've kind of almost you know seasonality is gone mm, in some yeah. respects because what you're seeing in the supermarket yeah, is stuff that's been there for a year because it's been. Um, chilled and kept perfectly. You know, apples they're saying are there for a year. Yeah. In the in the back with a sort of cool mist running over the top of them. But an apple loses one percent of its nutritional value every day it once it's picked. Oh, yeah. So if it's there a year, it tastes of nothing. You know, it tastes of nothing. Well, you know, it's like we serve raw turnip um, quite a lot actually because I really like it. And you know, no one's ever excited about turnip, are they? Because if ever you've had them, it's from the supermarket and they're soft and they're crap. Um, but you pick it out of the ground and it tastes like wasabi and horseradish and all these things that are a little bit sexier. Yeah. Um, and people generally don't believe that, you know, I'll say, oh, this is turnip because, we, you know, we've we've maybe cut it into rib. I say ribbons, I mean long sheets, not ribbons yeah. like, you know, yeah. bow ties. Yeah. Um, and they eat it and it's it's crunchy and it's fresh and it's juicy and it's, you know, it's, it's spicy and a little bit sweet. And that doesn't... Yeah, it's, it's almost like with a what forgotten they've... veg, though, isn't it? It's a bit like, you know, we talked to a, um, a music director who was talking about forgotten instruments. You know, people don't play some of the bassoons and all that sort of stuff. Turnip these... is one of the things that people have gone, well, actually, we feed it to the cattle, really. We kind of, you know, take the yeah. tops off and then whatever. I it, it, it isn't sexy. So no. is that part of your thing then as well? It's like, yes, we want to make sure it's micro-seasonal, but we also kind of want to make stuff that people, like sweetbreads, you know, automatically people have that, oh, veal, oh, liver, oh, not sure about that, and make um, it, make turn it into something that people go, do you know what, actually, it was lovely, by not telling them what it is. I think I, there probably is something in there in my sub, sort of subconscious that wants to be a little bit provocative that way. Yeah. Um, but essentially, it comes down to that's what we've got. 
Yeah. Okay. You know, we don't have any choices behind that. It's it's what we've got, so that's what we'll use. So we'll do things to make them. We'll do what we can to make them tasty. And you know, as you say, I think we've forgotten about all these things that aren't attractive and sexy anymore. And you do interesting things to them, and all of a sudden they're really tasty. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. So what? Are you, so what are you enjoying at the moment? So if your favourite stuff, I mean, you know. Again, you know, I love food. You know, I've enjoyed reviewing restaurants for years. Uh, enjoyed eating out when someone else paying for it, a hundred percent. Of course. Um, but obviously, you know, that often becomes trendy stuff. Yeah. You, know, you kind of talk about kelp or buckthorn or whatever, and 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 trends that go now. Are you trying to avoid those, or are you going? Actually, no, I love this at the moment. This is, and it stays. It's something um, that resides in the menu throughout. A bit like you said, sweetbreads went in, and then nah, not so much. And then maybe we'll bring it back or. It's it, it's more of a case of when I get bored of stuff. Right, okay. So for a while, I'll use an ingredient. You know, my favorite ingredient at the moment is something called kosho. And it's um it's it's something we make ourselves, but the Japanese make uh, something called yuzu kosho. So they take chilies and they ferment them with uh, yuzu juice yeah, okay. and salt. And you get this spicy, sweet, sour, hot sauce. It's amazing. So we do the same thing with quince. I mean, who eats quinces anymore? Do you know what? I, can I tell you my quince story then? Because actually go I did it. it last week. It Some, we went, we went I'm going to steal this. Friends. They went, oh, by the way, we picked a load of quince from the garden. Do you want them? I was like, let's have a quince off. You make something. I'll make something with quince. And I made some quince membrio. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Obviously, as you do. Took it to some friends. Jack, stop laughing. Um, <clears throat> took it to some friends, laid it out, boiled it down, chopped it, cored it, added the same amount of sugar as whatever. Let it go cold in the fridge. And it was literally strips of this stuff to have with cheese. Oh, my God, it was amazing. I probably would have, you know, as a kid, booted them in the garden or yep, just completely. moan over them as an adult. Yep. But so quince for me, it's like, again, it's like a forgotten fruit. It's a forgotten thing and people just aren't using it. No. But then... I said to some friends, oh, I'm bringing, I'll bring a cheese course. Uh, um, I made some quince membrero then. Yeah, you did. I know you so did. So middle class. A bit weird. Oh, yeah. like, <laughs> Two thirds bird, I think was my nickname. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's yeah. weird. It's like using stuff, you know, that people have ignored, wildly ignored yeah. for years. I mean, gooseberries. We do, we do, we also do the, the kosher with gooseberries as well. So we get some locally grown chilies and then, you know, from the greenhouse and, you know, we do good. And nobody eats gooseberries anymore because nobody can be bothered to stick their fingers in and, um, yeah. You only really get gooseberries in high-end restaurants who are brave enough to yeah and send so the children into pictures. So yeah, I think so. We've got this little course on at the moment. Um, we've done it a few different ways, but and there's some there's reasonings behind it. There's two different reasons behind this. Firstly, because we've now got the Michelin plate, which is sort of it's not the star, but you know it's on the way. Next way, we're in the hundred meters final, but yeah, you know we're, we're coming last by a long way. Um, people are. Uh, we're getting a f quite a few people coming in expecting white tablecloths and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's not, that's no not us in the slightest. It's not me. Um, so we designed... Completely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We designed this course, essentially, it's going to sound really rubbish, but around the idea of a kebab. So, you know, when you go out, you get, you've had a few drinks, you have a naughty kebab. So we've got a piece of pork belly that we, we cook for a long time and we compress, so it's really dense and tasty. <clears throat> Excuse me. We cover it in a little ketchup made from sort of uh, thyme and parsley and vinegar and stuff. So it's sweet and sour. And then we make this little hot sauce to go with it. And you, you use your fingers and you eat your piece of meat and then you, you pick your bowl up and you drink your sauce. Delicious. And it's um and so it's a it's a bit sort of not greasy is the wrong word, but you know what I mean you have to lick your fingers yeah, yeah. afterwards and it's sticky and you pick your bowl up you, and it all of a sudden it's sort of it, it levels the dining room out. Absolutely. You know, all those who want that white tablecloth and silver service, they, mm -hmm. they realise, right, this isn't happening now. And those who come... And that's encouraged by you. You're saying, please pick it up at the end. Yeah, slurp stick sauce. your fingers in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But those, there's also the other side of that where we get the... It's generally men, but the wives want to come or the girlfriends and the guys have been dragged along to this fancy restaurant. I'm saying that in quotation marks. Yeah. And they don't want to be there because it's going to be up tea and they're going to be tiny portions. They're not going to eat anything. And then all of a sudden they're drinking out of bowls and eating this, you know, so sort of good. thing that's almost kebab-like. And But who started were, that? I mean, who, I mean, I remember going to, to Fat Dark early 2000s and um, I think the out came the Nage of Cockles with headphones yeah, and an iPod. Yeah, yeah. And you were designed, you're supposed to listen to the sounds of the sea while you ate the cockles. And that was the kind of point. It was just like creating not only a sort of, you know, an extra sensory level of food. And then you'd see tables of six and eight with sort of, you know, businessmen with sort of headphones on, sort of eating, not sort of not sure what they were doing. Yeah. Um, but 
that kind of I guess you're creating an additional dimension then food is great but obviously the the actions of that and being unafraid to pick it up slurp it because whenever anybody goes to a restaurant we take the kids to nice restaurants all the time right sit up make sure you do this or not you know we go to river cafe once a year Very nice. London, which we yeah. adore absolutely adore and they're so brilliant with the kids but they're all you know i remember the waiter coming up first time and looking at lila who was six going um well i can make a we can make us some sort of like pizza. <laughs> and Lila was like, well, I quite like the lobster and well, the turbot. The... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Very middle class. Very middle class. But it is weird that sh they love food. They love octopus. They love, you know, not yeah, because yeah. they go, we have octopus all the time, but because they have octopus and they just eat it. Yeah. And a friend of mine, a friend of mine who ran a, we did some work with him, ran the smoothie company and um, very London. And he was on the beach with his kid. His kid was two and his kid picked up a handful of sand and went, Daddy, look, looks like chia seeds. And he's like, shut up, <laughs> shut up. Don't say that ever again. You know what I mean? Because why is food, why should food be middle class? I'm doing quotation marks yeah, now. No, because you want kids to love great food. I don't want my kids to go to a nice restaurant and have pizza. I want them to go and muck in. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I, th I don't know. I think for me, it's about trying to make people relax. Because when you're relaxed, then you take things in and... Um, and it's more fun though, isn't it? As totally. well, it's just yeah, it's it's you know, there's one restaurant that uses this term uh, fun dine, not fine dine. Okay, and that makes me want to eat the side of my mouth. That term, yeah, it's, it's, really um, it's almost it? like those fans <laughs> who say, "Oh, we're not this anymore." Because they want to be, yeah, it's just. Oh. <laughs> but uh, there's there's something in that, I guess. You know, let's uh, try and get away from that very formal stuff. That's just stuffy. I mean, formal seeing some people, so you know, <clears throat> I get that. But actually, if you're if you're with family and friends, you're, you're there. Food is the centerpiece. You want to relax time, yeah. You want to you want to relax. Yes, yeah. that's kind of what we're doing. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Oh God, <laughs> tough, question. Um, tough question time. Which celebrity chef are you most like, Ouch. and have you one of your favourites? You a Gordon Ramsay swear a we lot. We haven't or... got the beat button <clears throat> primed, ready for you. Right. Do you know De Campo, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> on this place. <laughs> It's like, Even it's, I would never dare utter that. There's name. two I really dislike, and you managed to get both of those in the same <laughs> sentence. Oh, there we go. <laughs> no, I'm. Um, if I'm honest, like it's the uncoolest answer in the world for a chef. But Jamie Oliver got me into cooking. Uh, you know, it was the right time and place. You know, I was, I'd, I'd met a long-term partner. We'd stop going out drinking all the time as you do, and started staying home and cooking. And so good. Yeah, completely. You did a basketball know. hoop at the bottom of your spiral staircase you and a go. little Vespa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was me. That was <laughs> <laughs> um, and so Jamie Oliver got me into cooking without a doubt. Um, and then the other one's a guy called Magnus Nielsen. So um, yeah, he was one of the spearheads in Nordic cuisine. And I used to, um, I used to go to Waterstones in Shrewsbury and look at the book um whenever i could and just it was i can't i can't expect you know when you you're into a style of music and then you hear something that is completely different to make you go i've never heard anything like that before i don't know what's going on it, you know it completely changes everything about you well that was you know uh magnus's book favicon and yeah so he's the guy yeah. yes he's um it's funny, isn't it? Because everybody's got favourites. You know, Jamie, I think, is brilliant. And, you know, just, just because he put it across in a way that no one else had managed yeah. to do at that and time. I mean, it was real serendipitous that he was there in the first yeah. place. It shouldn't have been him. And you know, fair, he gets a bit of a bad rap, but yeah. I don't think it's fair. I think he's trying, yeah. he's trying his best for people and just people don't... Won't what are your thoughts on to Nigel it? Slater? Because I've got all his books, but I cannot bear him on TV or I can't bear... I don't think I've seen much of him on TV, really? to be honest. Yeah. I know, you know, I know who you mean. I've seen bits and pieces of the... Yeah. Um, funny he does that show at home, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I don't really know much of him to be honest. You know, we used to watch a bit of Rick Stein. Yeah, he was all right. You know, it's, um, I don't cook fish, so he's kind of don't you? Not not in the restaurant. Although we have got a scallop dish on at the moment, we serve that raw. Um, so you really don't cook it? No, we really don't <laughs> cook fish in the restaurant. <laughs> I try to think who else was um, a big deal for me when I first started. But, um, Fernie Whittenstall. Oh, fab. The whole River Cottage yeah, River thing. Yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that was massive as well. But of course, he had this sort of garden that everybody assumes you've got then. You know, this kind of amazing, <laughs> you know. And I've been to Le Manoir a couple of times with some great friends. that They've yeah. paid every time. Um, that's why they're great friends. <laughs> <laughs> but their kitchen garden is amazing. So every kitchen garden, and you're talking about foraging, you know, is there stuff that we can all be doing to kind of, you know, we're talking about cost of living and trimming down. In one minute, you're talking about sort of really swanky, without an S, restaurants, <laughs> yeah. um, which are sort of super expensive and obviously out the realms of lots of people. Um, you've also got, you know, you're foraging and you're sort of saving money because you're using what's around you. Yeah. I guess we could all learn a little bit from that. Well, I think moment. a lot of, you know, really good restaurants, and I'm not 
putting my restaurant in there. You know, I it think it's really there. good. But, you know, um, mm. I'm moving more towards that, you know, restaurant with a farm or restaurant with a, you know, a small, small holding or yeah. allotment or with paid foragers because it's, I mean, you do save some money. It's yeah. still expensive, you know, it's, and you, <clears throat> more importantly that you can guarantee quality as well. Yeah. You know, you know what you get in, you can... I don't know if it's anyone like you, but, you know, I drive past, you know, trees laden with apples that are falling on the floor yep. and no one's seemingly bothered. You know, we used to, you know, probably 20 years ago on a Sunday afternoon, you'd see so many kids out with little buckets collecting blackberries and all that sort of stuff. We've got a little bit away from that, yeah, maybe, completely. you know. I, don't th- I mean, I don't know if that's a supermarket thing. I mean, supermarkets are the root of all evil to some degree, you know. It's, yes, indeed. It's why there's no record shops anymore and it's why there's no green grocers and no mm. fishmongers and... You know, there's no bookshops anymore, and yeah. um, that hurts. But I guess it's because we all want convenience, don't we? Yeah. I don't know if that's an internal thing that we just want convenient lives, or it's an external thing because nobody has any time to do anything anymore. Yeah, I don't know. But I was in London a couple of weeks ago at Borough Market, and it was absolutely t- you couldn't move, yeah. and you know, dropped a load of money at the Ginger Pig. Um, oh, I think the food's great, you know, their own blooming ketchups and barbecue sauce. So, I love, you know what I mean? It's just stuff that you yeah. just think that's a little bit different. It's got a little bit of something extra yeah. into it. Um, where do you go? Where's your, you know, if you're not eating at a restaurant, where's your general inspiration? Are you going to a Shropshire farmer's market? Are you going to Ludlow Food Centre? Um, I find a lot of those places quite identical, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, you know, they all have the same producers, you know, the same cheese guys, the same beer guys, the same... Yeah, uh, you know, salumi producer, and while they're all very good, you see the same things all the time. So for me, it, a lot of it is it's books and stuff like that. Right, okay. Um, You're constantly going into Waterstones, not paying for not it. Pay, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Did you ever buy that book, or was it? <laughs> I've got it. Yeah, <laughs> he's got no, a, a to, series um, of 290 photos in his iPhone. <laughs> I, have to, um, I have to get them delivered to the restaurant next. My other half keeps shouting at me about it. So oh, buy so many books. Um, I, do love I mean, no, book. there is. I mean, you know, you see things. You see things on TV and social media is massive. Obviously, you know, sort of. Sheffield's a very incestuous little world, and we all follow each other on Instagram. You see one thing, and the next thing, you know, the next eight or nine chefs are all doing the same thing. Right. Um, and again, you know, my mother-in-law's little allotment is big as well. Now that sounds really twee, and I love but that. you go in there, and it's like, right, we got this, and we got this, and we got that, and you know, the couple of the people who will there's a um, there's a lady with a little farm, and um, she does sort of rare breed beef and sort of retired dairy cow stuff like that but she also does foraging and we have a little thing whereby you as a consumer or a customer or a guest or whatever you want to call you you have no idea what you're eating and you know and she does the same with me so she will just bring me what's good great so whenever she turns up and it's like right we we have these to work with so that's really nice because it it sort of forces you to do something you know it's I can't just sit at home all week thinking, right, this week I'm going to do this with the carrot and go through all these processes and yeah. all these things that are going to make me seem like I'm really clever. It's like development kitchen <coughs> stuff, though, isn't it, then? It's like you, but yeah. it's like Heston stuff, I guess. You know, it'd spend next door was the... Yeah, was the, it's a little bit more on the fly what we do, but... Yeah. But lots in, of restaurants, in a good way. But yeah, lots of restaurants kind of, you know, won't have many. So I mean, I was a bit of an addict to Chef's Table when it kind of came out on Netflix. And, yeah. So know, written on the tiles, on that. yeah. yeah written on, on the it. tiles, you know, what's what's today? Well, what's good? Yeah. You know, veg truck would turn up outside at eight in the morning and all the chefs would be lined up. And, you know, you've got head chefs sort of smelling everything as it comes out going, oh, maybe we can do this with a parsley cream. And I was like, oh, my God, that is just heaven. I, that's what happens then, I yeah. guess, if you get your foraging lady to. And that, that's essentially, you know, what how we do it. And, you know, while there are sort of maybe base ideas, you know, bits and pieces around it. So we find that, you know, I'll know what the proteins are. So I can kind of plan to some degree, you know, I know what protein's on this week because I went and picked it up before I came here. Okay. Um, I don't know what the dish around it is. I just know what that side of it is. And we're playing around with a few ideas for it at the moment. So, um, Hold on. So you split it into things. You'll go right. Carb of the week is this. Protein of the week is that. Is that? How, do you split it away from what I, the actual ingredient is? I have to. I have to pre-order what proteins I want. So, you know, if I want pork belly or if I want lamb or whatever. So I'll know what that is, but what it's going with and what the dish is going to be is a little bit more up in the air a lot okay. of the time. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're kind of working on a dish at the moment. So. A lot of the dish will happen on the fly, but then every now and again, there'll be a dish that we'll try and try and try. And there's one we're working on at the moment. I can't quite get right. What is it? We'll help. I can't tell you. Oh, really? 
I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, sorry. I didn't require much pushing, did it? <laughs> Um, I'm going to take him a really strong coffee <laughs> when he arrives. Oh, yeah, that was it. Was it. <laughs> five beans, actually. I don't think anyone's had a five bean coffee <laughs> from here. I'll tell you this, it'll never end up hitting the menu. Um, so it's sort of a three part. I like. I like lots of dishes where you um, you'll turn up at the table with sort of two or three parts, and the guests is like, "What the hell's going yeah. on?" Um, so it all started a while ago. We um, we got our butcher to take some pork belly and to age it for a hundred days. Um, in soy, in soy sauce. Amazing. And so it's become almost like, have you ever tried katsubushi? You know, yeah. the, uh, it's almost like katsubushi, but pork. Wow. And so we we make a stock out of this this pork, which is it's dry and it's gnarly, and it's but it's got loads of flavor. Add some smoked bacon to it, and then you get this little pork broth. It's bacony, it's porky. It's, it, it's almost sort of Japanese in style, yeah. but, you know, not. Um, no heat, no... No, nothing. We just do what... And then we're... To that, we're adding a little raw egg yolk and some noodles made with chestnut flour and seaweed. So these little chestnut and seaweed. So you've got these little sweet noodles. They've got the umami of chestnut and then this pork broth. So it's like pork and noodles. To go with it, we've got a little guinea fowl breast. So we're going to roast the breast off, um, give it a little, um, uh, what's it called? Painting, brushing, whatever. Yeah, okay. Glazing is yeah. the phrase I'm looking for. Okay, I like painting. Uh, painting. A <laughs> yeah. uh, little fermented chili, some honey from a friend of mine in Telford, uh, a few other bits and pieces. And then we're going to stir it with a little steam, steam bun as well. So uh, it's sort of like a cross between a bun on the side, no. sort of, but not quite anything in the steam bun. So we're taking, the, so we get the um, the guinea fowl in whole. Leg. So we're going to confit the leg, yeah. uh, flavour that up with some bits and oh pieces. God, we don't know yet. Stuff it. No, no, no. But nobody. The, the I was expecting nice, breakfast to see well, James, <laughs> <laughs> and I bought nothing. Um, but nobody knows when they get the they get the little. This will be the second bread course at this point. When they get the little steam bun, you can't see that it's stuffed with leg. So then you sort of bite into it. It's got all this sort of comfy meat Dude, in there. And it's just, good. You're really and it's just good. quite nice that there's like bits and pieces. And I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of a big plate of food. Yeah, let's just no. Pick and what type of bread have you got, James, for lunch? What's your um, what's oh, your lunch? Oh, tomato soup. Tomato soup. Today. Tomato soup. You go. I mean, literally, how on earth? And I brought you nothing. I know. Nothing. He brought nothing. <laughs> not even a cake. Not even yeah. like a little nibble. Like by the way, guys. No, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I got some spies. You got some <laughs> mince pie, some Greg's. I've not really seen one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what we're working on, but Great. we've not nailed it yet, so it might not. And is that just you way. developing it, or is there a team of? No, no, I've got. It was me for a week. Long suffering long. chefs who no, have no, to no, try I've, stuff um, for it. I've got ready. a new boy in now. Um, I was on my wife. I had my, had a chef, a second chef. We getting in the second chef was massive for me because okay. all of a sudden you've got a massive wage bill. Mm. And, you know, we've always constructed the business on the idea that I can do it and there's not massive outlay so that we can do this yeah, okay. ridiculous 14-seat restaurant and not charge a fortune for it. Um, but it got to that point where I needed one. She eventually left because chefs do that. They get to about a year and off they, yeah. off they pop. Um, but I've got a new boy in and um, I think he's a bit bemused by it all, to be honest, because <laughs> I work in a very different way okay. and um, to where he's worked before. But... No, he's um. But it is a big deal. It's a it's a it's a big wage bill. Of course, it is. And yeah. also, you've got someone who wants to develop. So you want someone who come up with their own ideas. Who's yep. going to be pushing you? You know. No, completely. And you, I've almost got to. When you get more stuff, you know, I've got two sommeliers in now as well who've got definite ideas about stuff. Okay. Um. It can't just be the me show once you get staff in because you have to give them some bits and pieces. Yeah, you know, they yeah. have to get their little ideas in or aspects of and same with the sommeliers, you know, they have to serve in the ways they want. We were having a conversation the other day, actually. So my head sommelier, she's a retired teacher. She was a primary school teacher, uh, retired because all teachers hate teaching now. And um, she was a customer. She and they drink a lot. Is that the link to the sommelier? Well, here's the thing. She'd never <laughs> drunk wine before. Oh, you know, she bought like, you know, five pound bottles from Tesco. Oh, really? Um, I'd, I was advertising for a manager stroke sommelier and she came in and she's absolutely unbelievable. Is she? she can, um, she can talk and she can, a lot of sommeliers can't speak, can they? They're, no. um, where she can communicate in a way that really hits people the right way. Um, Great. but we are having to talk about s traditional serving tech. So, you know, the chefs will serve a lot. And, uh, I say the chefs, me and Ruben, the other yeah. guy, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Chef sounds like a team, doesn't it? Um, and traditionally we'd always serve, um, ladies first because that's what you do. 
and um, so she was there and my daughter my daughter's 15 and this is her first job she's she's going to be a doctor or something she's very clever but I figured she needed a job working with the general public yeah, for a while great. to kind of really good for them yep you know, break her into what the general public are really like <clears throat> and they were horrified that we would serve women first for no other reason that they were women right okay and um so we've, we've had a bit of a discussion around this recently which is quite nice and so we stopped doing that because my head sommelier doesn't want to do right, it okay. anymore so it's who's closest or how do you who do you pick the whoever straws? you turn up at first yeah right, okay yeah. it's it's as simple as that and um but it's it sits uneasily with me because traditionally that's what we do. Yeah, but then we're a young progressive restaurant, so why are we doing things that are traditional? But that's you know, it's you have to let your staff get their ideas and their opinions yeah. in and tweak what we do slightly. So mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that brings me on to um, another tough question. Oh, uh, I don't like this not knowing questions good business. Cop, bad cop. Yeah, yeah. Go on. I'm the bad cop, I'm afraid. Um, obviously receiving criticism must yep. be part of the job. Yep. How well do you uh, receive it? You know, I'm... <laughs> He's got all the bad reviews tattooed on his back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I turned up at a table the other week, actually, and she, she'd she marked every dish out of 10. That was quite horrifying. Um, <sighs> no, to be fair, touch wood, we do all right. Criticism, I'm... If I agree with it, then fine, I'll take that on board. If I don't agree with it, then I, I don't care, essentially. It sounds yeah. really awful, but... You don't have sleepless um, nights, <clears throat> you know, one bad you know, review from a customer. No, because... Who, well, yeah, again, yeah, okay, so yes, if they are right, if I know I've done something that isn't quite right and they've picked up on it, then that annoys me and I can't sleep, you know, I'll yeah. sit at home stewing about it. If it is that it wasn't to their taste, you know, we had a customer on Saturday night who didn't like one of the wines. Um, it was paired with a scallop dish, actually, and traditionally he always hates these wines and we always try and say to him, you know, have something else, but he doesn't, he wants to go with it, and then he'll say, I don't like that. <laughs> Um, you know who you are. <laughs> you know, lovely guy, really lovely, lovely guy. Really knows yeah. his food as well. But you know, he always hates his wine. But I'd had that exact wine with a, a scallop dish in Denmark, and it worked brilliantly. So I know it worked. So you could tell me it doesn't work, and that's fine. That's your opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Subjective. Um, subjective um, yeah. It's subjective. Yeah, it's subjective. Yeah. So if there's something in the complaint, then yeah, it bothers me. But for the most part, no, because I can't. You know, someone said to me um, a while ago. I had a complaint a while ago. It was quite a long complaint, actually. And he complained about... Well, firstly, he complained about the music. I was like, well, what music do you want me to play? And what if, you know... What not, were you playing? Uh, I think I was playing Sonic Youth, something like okay, that. Okay, fine, great. Um, <laughs> and then Throw I said, well, out. what about if, you know, 90-year-old Doris doesn't like what you want to play? You know, where do I pitch this? Mm. And he's like, oh, right, okay, okay. And he said, I didn't like the food. I was like, well, that's fine. I can't do anything about it. I went to see the new Top Gun with my other half, and I thought it was the worst piece of rubbish I'd ever seen in my life. Right, okay. Doesn't mean anything, does it? It's no. just it is what it is. And then he didn't like the wines. I was like, well, you drank a bottle, and between you and you had two wine flights and drank it all. So you know, yeah. but you kind of you pick kept and trying it until you didn't like it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I didn't like it. I had to drink the whole bottle oh, to yeah. decide. <laughs> but I think you just kind of, I think you work through things and pick out what you feel is important. You can change, and some things you can, you can think, yep, yeah, all right, cool, let's do that. Other things are just nonsense. But not many chefs front up. So in some respects, you're probably putting yourself in the line of fire, or maybe you're you're sort of soothing their 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 ire because you're in front of them, and it's obviously always very difficult to tell someone to their face if their food's shit. I don't know, Do you know what I mean? And maybe it isn't. Maybe it is. Maybe it is easy to go. Actually, now you're here. I wanted to tell you this, but you know, often you know, if you go to nice restaurants, you won't ever see the chef. They're probably not there anyway if it's a celeb. Um, but no one ever come out and go, "What did you think of that?" So in some respects, you're you're braving it yeah well a, a lot of when i go out and speak to people it's more about you know what about the menu what questions you got about the menu because i write it really ambiguously so i've got room to move in there and Great. and so that we'll have a conversation because you know when i was 18 and i had you know spare money like not that i do anymore you know i go to loads of gigs and speaking to bands after the gigs was always like god i just spoke to the guy from well haven do you know what I mean? this is incredible Holy i mean grail, yeah, and um yeah. It was great speaking to people, and that's what you remember. So we, we tried to speak to people. Um, and, you know, some people will, you know, have issues with bits and pieces. And, you know, sometimes we'll take, like I say, sometimes we'll take that on. And yeah. But it's just nice to have a conversation with people. And if they do have, you know, some people don't like the fact that they want to know after every course what we've eaten and stuff. Yeah. 
and I can, ju- you know, I can justify every decision to them and whatnot. And um, but because it's you, so in some respects, <clears throat> yeah. maybe that maybe that's easier. If it was yeah. a twenty-year-old waitress, you know, or a young lad, you know, just probably yeah. get befuddled by a bit of yeah. that. But I think because you front that, it's you feel sort of enveloped in that process. You yeah. know, is right. I'm going to James's restaurant. I know a bit about James. I know a bit about his food. I'm really excited about doing that. What's the repeat custom? Because, you know, I, I've See, been, this I was is like, oh my massive. God, this is, this was amazing. And then we took some friends. Then you go, okay, well, the same as Dolce Beach on Friday yeah, night. Yeah. I probably wouldn't return there straight away because I'd had the six yep. course tasting menu and then go, well, how often is it changing? Yeah. Well, you know, so how do you get people who keep coming back? Because massive, like, like uh, uh, great. usually most restaurants work on about 25% return rate. Okay. Ours is nearly 60%. Wow. You know, my sommelier had been to us about 25 times before she started working to, working for us. Wow. The guy I've just spoken about, who uh, hates the orange wine, he's 30, 40 times. It's, you know, we have um, a regular vegan. I shouldn't call her a regular vegan. You know, but she's, again, she's probably been 20 or 30 times. And, I've, you know, we don't repeat her dishes or whatnot. Mm. And um, Orange wine, by the way, is a bit hit and miss. I mean, I think I had a Lebanese orange wine, and it was a bit like. Mm. Yeah, all, all it seems like it was. Yeah, no, of course. You know, I hate red wine. It just it, it's boring. It's it, and quite often you have it with food, and that's all you can taste. Yeah, mm. you know, I used to review um, for newspapers, and I was probably shooting from the hip on a few occasions. But and you know, I know some people went. Nathan Rouse has closed seven restaurants that we know of uh, in the Midlands, <laughs> and I was like, I haven't closed them. I might have put a nail in the coffin. But it was on the back of, obviously, if you're serving bad food and it's bad service and, you know, it's very empty dining, that isn't me, that yeah, is yeah. the process. <laughs> I'm probably coming at the end of somewhere which isn't that great. So bad reviews never close a restaurant, you know, some, you know but it's subjective, of course yeah. it is. Um, but I think you have to, I was always very cautious as, as a result of that, knowing that you have a little bit of power in the pen. Um, to be able to sort of say what you think. And sometimes, yes, you're doing it for an audience, you know, and I love Day Gill, Gill and I read and I roar with laughter and feel slightly sorry sometimes for the restaurant. Yeah. Um, you know, so I know, I, know, I know it's difficult, but I'm not a massive complainer. Mm. But you? Um, no, I mean, it would have to be pretty, pretty bad for me to sort of, yeah. But sometimes complain. they are pretty bad and people don't say anything. No. But they just don't go again. Yeah, yeah they so leave well, it up to Yeah, that describes me, really. I just wouldn't go again. But I always used to say some people it. would be like, it's a 50th wedding anniversary. Mm. It's a massively important meal. And if the food is crap, then mm. you're ruining I it. I suppose, is it crap, though, because it's not your taste? Or is it crap no, because it's been cooked badly? And I yeah, suppose that's agreed. where it's... Mm. Yeah. You know, my, my other half and I, we always end up in places that I don't want to go because I know that it's, it's just... <laughs> It's too expensive for what it is, but it's not expensive. You know, the yeah. local pub who does a burger, and I'll say, do you want it pink or do you want it well done? And I'll say, I want it pink, please. And it comes through well done. Yeah. That's just rubbish. Yeah. Um, but you don't complain. You just don't go, do you? Go again. Well, no, because you know what's going to happen if it goes yeah, back. Completely. What okay. about your reviews? Do you religiously study them and reply to each one? or No. So here, so I'm the guy that's your feedback. I don't <laughs> care about TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor is a virus. Yeah. However, I check it every day. Um, <laughs> I do. And for the most part, we've we've only got one bad one. And I remember that table. And he, Nathan, it wasn't you. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he come in, <laughs> the guy had come terrifying. in once before and had a great, great night and went home and wrote a brilliant review. Came in another night, and this is the problem with TripAdvisor. Um, the, we got a table of six in that were really noisy that night. And because that kitchen's open, I can see everything from the past. You know, I can see everything that's going on. So, yeah. and my staff as well, you know, know because I keep shouting at them. Um, <laughs> don't do it like that. I could see that he kept looking over it. Every time they were loud, there was one guy who got this really, really sort of, um, you know, an annoying, annoying laugh. And this guy kept look. he kept looking over at him. And I was like, he's not having a great night because it's noisy. And he mm. went home and he wrote a bad review. Okay. And... It's frustrating because that review wasn't about the food per se. It was yeah. about his experience because that other table were noisy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it stays. It's a stain. Yeah. It's and so a... I've ignored it, but it's, it's there on my record almost. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah. you know, people can read it. And it says not as good as, you know, not mm-hmm. as good as first time. Well, I know the food was better because we'd been there about six months by then and you're growing and you're getting mm-hmm. better. But, but is, that dif- is that a thing that, with restaurants that is a difficult to replicate that first experience? Le Manoir, the first time I went there, I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Beautiful sunny day. Walk around the gardens. Um, house champagne was fab. Beautiful little amuse-bouche. Gorgeous service. All that sort of second time. 
You're a bit like, oh, okay, sort of, you know, well, the Conservative looks a bit cack at the moment. Do you know what I mean? It's still a bit um, chintzy. Did I really notice that last time? Oh, maybe the champagne doesn't taste quite as good or whatever it was. It's really interesting how maybe you get that. I think, so that's something I'm really conscious of. And this is why, some of the reason behind changing the menu constantly. Okay. So that, you know, we go back to that vegan. She's never had a repeated dish. Um, I mean, the dish is repeated on her, but she's... <laughs> 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 um, you know, so when you come, you know, for the second or the third or the fourth time, you know, maybe the restaurant's arranged slightly differently or there's a different piece of art on the wall. The menu is certainly different for the most part. And it's just so that it makes it, you know, it separates it off. It's not the same dining room that you sit in, you've sat in, you know, loads of times before having the same menu. It's it's different to some degree. Mm. And, you know, the wine, you know, the wine list changes every month so that yeah, you okay. can't have that same wine again. So you're having that new experience again. So it's in a place that's familiar and it's in a concept that's familiar, but there's still lots of new things. So you're it's like going to the cinema. You know, you can go to the same cinema constantly, but you see that different film. Yeah. It's a different mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. And so we try and treat it like mm-hmm. that, essentially. I mean, I'm a, you know, this is probably a difficult podcast in some respects because I'm a real fanboy of yours and I, well, I love your stuff. I'm a good um, looking lad, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> <laughs> but t- aside from what you're doing, what's the current food scene like in Shropshire? And is there anybody out there? <laughs> it is. It is being videoed as well. Um, is there anybody out there that you kind of go, yeah, okay, that's quite nice. I'm, I'm quite into that. Is there this kind of sense of collaboration? Do the best chefs stick together? Do you hate um, each other? No, What's no, no, not at all. So, I mean, obviously, about 300 metres up the road from me, there's uh, Docket Thirty Three. Um, Stu did Great British Menu not long ago. Um, I was a bit frust- I was a bit worried about that actually because we were literally just about to open yeah. after lockdown. Yeah. And I saw that the guy. 300 metres up the road was on national TV. Um, but I think it's been quite good for us, actually, because they've had loads of attention. And uh, we've, you know, we've I think we've profited off the back of that because, yeah. you know, people have been looking for that and found us. But also we've not had that microscopic sort of, you go with those expectations, yeah. don't you? I've been on TV and yeah, whatnot. And everyone's forgot about me being on TV because it was, you know, 10 years we'll ago. keep reminding them. Um, there you go. Um, <laughs> I'm much thinner in those days. But no, I think so. Obviously, Doc is sitting around. You know, we've talked about Gennaro doing great things. Uh, the Walrus is doing something interesting as well. But we're all very different to each other. You know, Gennaro's got that obviously that Italian thing happening. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, the Walrus is it's sort of much more classical than I am, but still really interesting. The same with Dockets. You know, he watched Ramsey, and I think that shows up in the food, yeah. but in a really interesting way. And I'm off on that Nordic thing. So I think there's there's three or four places that are really interesting. But you were doing tasting menus kind of... Everybody seems to be doing a tasting menu now, yeah. which is must be difficult because I guess in some respects that uh, when you started out, there was a, wasn't that many tasting no, experiences at all. At all. At all. It seems every pub and restaurant will do a tasting menu a bit like, okay. Well, I think we, we get away from that. Well, we, we, we get away with it because there's no menu. Yeah. You know, we're still... There's still not people, I'm going to use the word brave and I'm not bigging myself up now, but there's still not people who are brave enough to go, you know what, we're not telling you anything. Because it's massive and it puts off, I can't imagine the amount of people it's put off from coming to us. Yeah. But we've designed the restaurant around not needing that many covers because I don't want to do lots of covers. And I don't want everyone and their nan coming. I want that select few people who've really bought into the idea. Yeah. Um, but you're booked so, up for months. So, I mean, you know, which is a great thing. Right. Yeah, I think so. Of course you're so, doing stuff right. But does the TV so. stuff come calling continually? Or is no. that... You have to uh, you have to push that yourself? Is that a... Hi, everybody. Um, um, remember me. No. So, I mean, obviously there's the, the taste a while ago. Um, there's been a couple of bits that, you know, we did control. We did Escape to the Country yeah. a wee while ago. Um, they were just emails that turned up in the box. Um, great British menu. I'd love to do Great British menu should anyone be listening. But again, it's just something that turns out. I've got no interest in being a TV chef either. Yes, okay. But you just want that to use it as a. As a it'd be great platform. as a marketing tool, yeah. yeah. And a tool to, you know, I work on my own for the most part, other than, you know, Ruben, who's just joined me. Um, and it's quite hard to continually push yourself. And, you know, when you work in a team, there's always someone in that team that's better than you. Mm. Um, and, you know, they'll come and go, oh, I don't want to be like that, I want to do that, you know, I want to be able to do that skill. Whereas any skill I I need, I have to sort of make myself say, right, you, you need to learn that, you need to do that. And it's hard when your focus isn't just solely cooking because you're a business owner now and you've got bills to pay and you've got to think about your VAT return and you've got to think about fixing the toilet seat because someone's broken it for the fourth time on a Saturday night. And there's all these other things that take you away from, and it's very easy to kind of not coast it a little bit, but just yeah. 
stick with what you know and say, well, carry on doing that because people like it and we'll do it. Whereas something like Great British Menu would be like, well, I've really got to push myself. It'd be that okay. nice external sort of yeah. It's quite gimmicky factor. though, isn't it, now? But, you know, it is, I mean, it always yeah. has an element of gimmick. I mean, but, anything like know. that, you know, I do. What about Master? No, is, is Great British Menu more highly thought of than MasterChef the Professionals? The Professionals, yeah. like a base-level so. pro cook. I mean, let's be really dismissive. Uh, it's going to yeah, sound like I'm being dismissive. It? Yeah, yeah. It's what you get from it, isn't it? I mean, I know, for me, I think Great British Menu is the one for me because you're with guys who can really cook. Yeah. And every bit about me would be nervous and panicking and like, oh god i'm gonna be rubbish and just cannon fodder on there this year but that pushes you doesn't Fine. it yeah so yeah what are you cooking today well it's raw scallop i haven't touched it yeah there you go it's in there you go. <laughs> you know, i've it saved loads of time okay? as yeah. a chef though are you watching all these programs and you know learning from them yeah completely yeah, yeah. yeah. it's um you know you pick up bits and pieces and there's a guy who did something this year where he um he put scallops into liquid nitrogen to freeze them and then grated them straight into um, hot oil, and he made this little sort of scallop candy floss. Almost like reformed it. And um, yeah. so I'm going to rip that off at some point when I um, <laughs> when I get round to it. Um, so yeah, no, you're always picking bits and pieces, and that's kind of where you're because these are these are generally guys who are you know sort of leading the pack almost, and they're you know out front. So yeah, that's what we're looking at. And moving know? forward, um, plans for the business. You in Shropshire to stay? Oh, so... please stay. <laughs> no, no, no. So we asked no. So. I mean, I live in Shropshire. I've got kids. I've got four kids in Shropshire. I'm not going anywhere. No, we've. Um, I, mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not. To be honest, it's. Um, so it's our podcast. You can say what you like. <laughs> yeah, <there> you <laughs> no, so, um, no, we're trying to. Um, it's quite frustrating actually because the restaurant up the road have just announced something very similar. It's going to sound like I'm ripping them off, um, but we've got a piece of land um, out in the countryside, mm. and we'd like to build a restaurant with rooms on top. Um, so when I went to Noma, I walked down the path, I w- opened the door. You can't really, couldn't really see anything. All of a sudden you, it's this kitchen, this dining room is stunning. We want the same sort of thing. So, wow. you know, you walk through the door and there, there's the open kitchen and the dining room and, uh, you know, the wall is all made of glass looking at the, the trees and the little brook and the fields and whatnot. And then above that, with the same sort of idea is, you know, rooms because rooms is where we'll yeah, make money. And yeah. You know, once we're charging people 200 quid a night to stay, of course. which people will pay bizarrely, Easy. Um, we can finally start making some money and then, you know, get a little sort of um, fermentation house happening so we can do that sort of a more industrialised level. And yeah, there's That's all sorts of plans. kitchen stuff. Yeah, yeah, but we're waiting on planning and stuff like that yet. So, um, but it's that Baines, you know, it's that Baines was, um, you know, it's under a flyover in Nottingham. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, the rooms are 180, 200 quid. Yeah. You know, they are reasonable rooms. In well, fairness, you're kind of there for the food and, yeah. you know, you're... Well, ours will be next to the A49, but you'll walk through the door and none of that will exist anymore. Mm, yeah. Kind of like, you know, when you came to Turnhill. Yeah, I love It was that. at a busy, busy junction. It was great. But you came under the archway into the dining room and none of that stuff was there anymore. Parking was tight, I must admit. Yeah, and the guys who ran it were a nightmare about it. But, you know, never mind. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of, you know, restaurant and rooms, that's kind of what we're going for. Great. But, you know, we're in the early, early stages of But that's not a copy. That's, you know, planning. restaurant rooms, people go for restaurants yeah. and rooms. That's generally, well, you know, because you know, then the breakfast, and actually, you kind of have a mega dinner and then... For me, it's Next or, or the breakfast is yeah. the thing. Oh, I always look forward to oh, breakfast. I just yeah. love a breakfast, a hotel breakfast. I'm not doing breakfast, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> right. There are certain things as a business owner I'm not doing. Breakfast is one of them. You'll get a lovely housekeeper in to do a breakfast. Yeah, there you go. You know no, so, I mean, when I went to Innesia... <laughs> Buckthorn cereal. Um, there you go. <laughs> um, we, we were the only... Um, I say the couple. I went with my pastry chef at the time. Um, and... Yeah, we went down and, and we weren't the only people. We were the only people that weren't staying. They sent us home with them um, the sourdough they served for breakfast, and the whipped beet, uh, beef fat, amazing. and their butter. It was amazing, and just little bits like that were like, yeah, that's gonna be great. And um, so yeah, good breakfast, nice view when you wake up in the morning, you know. Right. And, um, away great. we go. Yeah. That's but also, plan. look how far that's come then from, as you say, being under the arch on the, you know, around, yeah. around about about forty one. Well, even that was massive compared to where we were was. before that. Is it? You know, we were. You know, to have actually something that was had some semi sort of permanence as opposed to doing one off pop ups, you know, once a week or twice a month, that kind of thing, to yeah. three nights, well, two nights a week there. And now we're three nights a week plus lunch on a Saturday and sold out for months. Yeah. Um, to, yeah, you're hopefully. Something right. <laughs> and what about multiple restaurants outside the county? Nah. London? No. That's not me. No. Um, 
I hate going to restaurants um, and... Stop it there, that's a clip. No, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're all crap. Um, I hate going to restaurants. No, okay, so when I went to Inesia, one of the great things about it was that Gareth, the head chef, the guy who owns it, the chef, the guy whose personality it's built around, he was cooking. Not only was he cooking, he cleaned the kitchen afterwards, which, wow. you know, I sat on the, the first table. I was like, that's quite cool that he's cleaning down afterwards as well. Um... I've got, you know, I've kind of got plans for a little sort of, uh, uh, sort of Scandinavian style bakery as well we'd like to do and um, bits and pieces like that. Mm. But I only want one restaurant. Yeah. yeah. There's, um, and uh, Gordon Ramsay, he didn't cook in his restaurant. Matt Abe is the executive chef for his restaurant and he designs all the dishes. He does, you know, he runs it all. It's his restaurant. It's just got some other guy's name on mm. it. Yeah. That doesn't sit right with me. No. You know, in my restaurant, I'm going to cook and and then I can be accountable and responsible for everything that happens and I can face the tables every night and they can yeah. tell me it was rubbish yeah. or it was brilliant. Yeah. One or the other. So, no, no more restaurants. Maybe a bakery. Oh, I just love Earth. that idea. <laughs> and also, you know, it, I guess it proves the strength of the county then if it can retain yeah. talent like you. That's kind of what we want. We you know. talent, honestly. Well, no, it's um, really important. But then, well, otherwise, everybody just goes, okay, I started out in Shropshire, I had a lovely little, and then I buggered off to London or Manchester yeah. or Edinburgh yeah. or, you know. Well, I think, I think some of it is coming into it at a certain age, though, isn't it? You know, I've got ties to here. Even if I could uproot Lou and the boys and go, and, you know, she works in Warrington, I'm sure she'd love to yeah. live a bit further mm. Cheshire wise. I have two daughters that live in Shrewsbury and they're not yeah. going anywhere from there. So I'm tied into here yeah. and uh, quite mm, like great. being tied in. It's nice to sort of have limitations and say, right, this is the box I work in. Yeah. Um, it's like the Danish filmmakers that did Dogma, isn't it? And um, no lights, no extent, no music, right, nothing okay. like that. Nothing. They just made films, you know, within these limitations that made them brilliant. You can almost have too many choices sometimes can't you and um well, also if we go back to kind of gron in helsinki a tiny kitchen the size of you know half the yeah. size of this room the kitchen is they work so efficiently the prep everything's in the prep do you know what i mean and yeah. then still the experience is incredible you don't need yeah, it to be a 150 covers with a kind of you know well, a lot of people come into us and say you know it's a lot more relaxed than i expected because they because we don't turn tables yeah you know they come in and they all eat at the same time so you know, there's not that constant to in and froing to customers and tables and, you know, sit down. It's really relaxed. Nice, relaxed environment other than Sonic Youth playing, which is a bit discordant and noisy. But that sort of, you know, balances <laughs> it out a little bit. The kitchen, as you say, it's all in the prep. So it's very calm in the kitchen. There's none of that throwing pans around and swearing. There's the odd bit. Of, I burnt yeah. my thing, thumb with a blowtorch a few weeks ago and I did swear quite loudly and everyone saw it. But, you know, other than Adds that. to the drama. Yeah, that's to the drama. The theatre. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But it's quite, and I think people enjoy the fact that, you know, it's quite calm and it's relaxed and they come in and they take their time and they go home when they want and it's, yeah, yeah that's it. Oh, we can't wait to come back. James, look, we've, uh, hilarious, I could spend hours, we've already run over by about 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, literally could spend hours talking to you. We must, we'll do this again. We might come and... Um, you know, we'll keep track, obviously, yep, of what we're doing. Um, we'd love to give you a good push as and when bakery comes and um, lean on the planners. We'll yeah. get the planners in, maybe, and have a, yeah, it have def a little chat def with them. It definitely needs it. You know, it would be, it'd be fabulous to see your progress. And, you know, we've charted it for a while now, just personally, as well as as well as well from a business. It's brilliant to kind of have a look at what you're doing. Um, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yep, thank great, you. Great to have you.